on what you might call an old school dick. A gumshoe that's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Well, actually, I'm not that keen on getting my hands dirty. I moisturise three times a day. It pays to have nice hands. What I mean by saying that I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty is that I get into places where others would fear to tread. No job is too small, no task is too big. I'm on a one-man mission, clearing up mysteries around the world, some stretching back centuries. A bit like Scooby-Doo, but without the annoying laugh and scruffy sidekick. I'll tell you how I got into this game a bit later, but I'm a dick for hire and that's all that matters. I don't take every case that lands on my desk, just the ones that interest me and pay well. It all started when I was on late night radio. You know the type of show that gets the flakes and insomniacs calling in when the pubs have shut and there's nothing else to do. I suppose that they could log into chat rooms and speak with like-minded people, but that wouldn't be the same, would it? They prefer to wind up the poor jock who's trying to keep his eyes open whilst entertaining the sleepless. I always imagined a private dick's life to be all oversized fedoras and whiskey, but that's a long way from the truth. Hanging around in hotel lobbies waiting for a correspondent in a divorce case to get caught with his pants down, it's not for me. I want excitement. Broads. I thought there'd be broads and dames galore, but the nearest I've come to any broads was on a day trip to Norfolk. Raymond Chandler's got a lot to answer for. Every private dick that you read about is a disgraced cop, fallen from grace, or a retired cop who can't get a job as an insurance investigator. Not me. I came down a different road. There's only so much I can tell you about my story as it's bound by the official secrets act although there is one part of it that's not. So I'll tell you about that. It'll give you an idea of where I'm coming from. Some time ago, I worked in military intelligence and they were looking for people to join a new department. When I saw that it was even more secret than the secret service I was in, I thought I'd have a go and put my name up for it. By the time that I'd measured myself up for an Aston Martin and practiced spinning around 90 degrees and shooting a Walter PP5, I found out that it was a desk job. Now you may be asking, what type of spying can be done from a desk? It didn't involve computers and it didn't involve satellites, nothing like that. They just gave me a pencil and a pad of paper. You're confused. How would you think I felt when I turned up for training in the extra secret secret service and was given less equipment than on my first day at school? I honestly thought it was some kind of initiative test. Here was I sat in a room with nothing more than a desk, a chair and a light, which was handy as there were no windows. This is as much as I can tell you about the training, not because it was classified, but mainly because I didn't have a clue what was actually going on most of the time. That was my introduction to remote viewing. A process which is best described as a what the butler saw machine where you didn't have to turn the handle. Basically, remote viewing is a technique where your mind can wander through time and space, hearing and seeing things thousands of miles away and even witnessing events that happened hundreds of years ago. It's fascinating stuff which in the wrong hands could be lethal. I'm going to use my skills to solve mysteries and theories that have never been explained. My first remote controlled assignment came when I was tasked with watching a group of suspected terrorists in Cardiff. My handler gave me the coordinates and set me in a room with my pencils and paper. I soon got to work and found myself in a large warehouse in the city. It was dark at first and I looked around the room for the bomb making evidence. What I found was to shake the world order out of its complacency and make the competing superpowers realise that the only way they could save mankind was to put aside their differences and work together. It was a routine operation that escalated into one of the most dangerous threats that this planet has faced. Even as an experienced remote viewer, I was shocked by what I had uncovered. I immediately reported to my superior officer who had me put into a car and sent directly to Downing Street to brief the Prime Minister. Not even senior members of the Cabinet were at that meeting. Just me and Numero Uno, the boss man. 
The information I was about to impart was considered so sensitive that it had to be kept from the British cabinet. After being shown into another windowless room, in the inner sanctum the PM entered and sat opposite me with a worried look on his face. Go ahead, tell me what you saw. He looked me straight in the eye without a flicker of emotion. I looked down at the briefcase that contained my notes. No man, don't refer to your notes. Tell me exactly how you remember it. Every last detail. Unused to speaking with people of such high rank, I cleared my throat and recounted what I had seen and heard. It was a large space, a bit like an aircraft hangar with no furniture. But when I looked closer, I could see what looked like an extraterrestrial craft. One of the sides was missing, which meant that I could get a clear look inside. And I moved closer and was shocked that I had to refocus to make sure that what I was witnessing was actually happening. What did you see, man? Tell me. Alien, sir. They were not of this world. My blood turned to ice as I re-envisaged the scene. They had arms and legs like us, but their heads blended into their body, and although they had holes for eyes and a mouth they had neither, also they had some kind of listening device where their ears should have been. A bit like headphones that you would wear when listening to the stereo and everyone else wants to watch TV. Go on. What could you hear? I could see that his hands were beginning to quiver. I was able to understand what they were saying. Is that part of your training that you can decipher languages? Whether they come from this planet or another? No, sir. They were speaking English. Speaking English? You would have thought that they would have had their own language. Subterfuge, sir. I recognised it straight away. It's an old trick. If they speak in their language and are overheard, then the game could be up for them. But I must say, they did sound a bit robot-y. They wouldn't have got a job presenting the news, if you know what I mean. And come to think of it, they did look a bit like robots. The Prime Minister was stunned into silence. It's a shame that nobody else was there to see that. It was then that I realised what they were saying. They intended to take over the Earth and make mankind their slaves. It was a bit hard to understand them at first, as remote viewing is not as easy as it sounds. Good God, man. Do you mean that there are aliens on this planet who are looking for world domination? That's exactly what I mean. The Prime Minister reached for the phone on the desk and ordered the person at the other end to get the President of the USA on the scrambled line. Within minutes, he was talking to Top Dog. That's secret service code for POTUS. Although why we couldn't call him POTUS like they do is beyond me. Their conversation was frantic and I could see the PM doing his best to calm the president who was getting flustered at the other end and going on about nuking the bastards. The phone was handed to me. How many of them are there? Well, I only saw about eight or nine, but there could be dozens of bases like these around the world. I've got no idea how many we could be dealing with. His voice went up an octave. Put puppy dog back on the phone. Who? Secret Service talk for the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I handed the phone back to the man in charge of the nuclear arsenal, who got into deep conversation. OK, you call the Russians and I'll give the Chinese a ring. Strange time for ordering a takeaway, I thought, but I'd never moved in these circles and just looked on in awe. Twenty minutes later, the Russians and Chinese were fully briefed and a Zoom meeting of the United Nations Security Council had been called for five o'clock, our time. The half an hour until that call seemed longer than 30 minutes, but soon the leaders of the free and not so free world were locked into debate as to what action should be taken. A heated debate came up with the conclusion that a nuclear strike should be ordered to wipe out the aliens, which was agreed by all, apart from the Kenyans. The Kenyan president argued that a nuclear strike could obliterate Cardiff and all of its inhabitants but the other statesmen on the Zoom call agreed that they would be collateral damage and could be sacrificed for the good of mankind. Personally, I thought that was a bit harsh, but I didn't have a say in the matter. Within two hours, 15 nations had their nuclear weapons pointed at this warehouse in Cardiff, with 15 fingers hovering over the buttons. When the French delegate said, has this information been verified? The PM looked at me. I've got no idea, I spluttered. I was brought straight here as soon as I've reported it. You'd better ask Eric. Who's Eric? 
It's amazing how world leaders can speak with one voice when they want to. Eric's my handler. He's the one in charge of the department. A sort of foreman without the overalls. The Prime Minister grabbed the telephone from the desk and ordered that he be put through to Eric immediately. After a few moments, he was in conversation with the man that I would trust my children with, if I had any. He slammed the phone back into its cradle and addressed the Zoom meeting. Eric said that it would take a little time to get it organised, so I suggest that we adjourn this meeting and we'll reconvene when he's got back to me. The Prime Minister told me that Eric was arranging for one of my colleagues to confirm what I'd seen before he ordered the strike. That was the last job I ever did for the British Security Services. It turns out that the terrorists were next door and I'd gone to the wrong address, which turned out to be the BBC Studios where they were filming an episode of Doctor Who and the Cybermen. You've got to laugh, haven't you? Cardiff could have been wiped off the face of the earth just because I got a couple of digits wrong, which would have been a shame, to be honest, as I like the Welsh. The good news is that now I'm out on my own, looking for mysteries to solve. You could say that I'm a dick for hire.